Thank you for uh, the invitation. Thank you um, to Albert for letting me go first, because I think when it comes to matters of climate resilience and urban design, I'm, I'm at most a dabbler next to you, Albert, who's been working on this really as part of your craft for decades now. But uh, what we'll be doing is each talking for about 20 minutes. I'll be doing a little overview on the climatological challenges facing Houston, and then a bit of a deep dive into some of the work that I've been doing in Northeast Houston. And we have a new partnership now that we're working on, an NSF grant for the next three years that'll look at participatory design planning and what we're calling infrastructural citizenship and how to build that in some of the more disadvantaged areas of Houston that have been historically neglected in terms of the provision and, and maintenance of their stormwater infrastructure. So, um, and then Albert will, will take things bigger, in, both in terms of time and in scale and sort of give you the big picture, longer outlook on what this type of urban design work can offer. So um, the general problem, and again, when you're giving this kind of talk in Houston to a group of Houstonians, forgive me for telling you the sky is blue, much of this you already know. Um, you know that the real problem is you know, what, what could be sustainability in uh, a megalopolis that was built in a swamp. And we have a, a great quote from one of our interlocutors up in the Northeast who put this very well. The fundamental truth that we need to get our head around, Houston was built out of a swamp. We put concrete everywhere. We built roads and bridges and skyscrapers. You can drive over the swamp now, but it's still a swamp with swamp weather and we've got to pay the freight for that decision. Um, I think that obviously when we talk about climate resilience in Houston, there's, there's an immediate charismatic pull towards matters of storms and flooding, and that's in no small part because of the series of 1,000-year and 500-year rainfall and flood events that we saw here between 2015 and 2019. Uh, we've had a bit of a respite from that kind of really catastrophic flooding, but that pattern, um, whether or not it's a new normal or not, I think you know still it's you're never going to lose money by suggesting another storm is coming to Houston, right? So it remains a problem. But of course, it doesn't remain the only problem we have to think about. If you look at Houston's heat index ticking up in a pretty linear way over time, you know that probably heat will become uh, one of the major existential crises of the city, especially for those who have to spend a lot of time outside, even before um, floods and sea level rise and other issues face us. And I always feel uh, obliged to remind us of the time bomb that sits 20 miles east of here in the Houston Ship Channel, where there are thousands of, of sort of self-regulated uh, petrochemical storage containers bunkering billions of gallons of hazardous uh, materials on any given day. And because of the amazing modeling that our colleagues in engineering have done, folks like Phil Bedient, Jim Blackburn, Jamie Paget, and others, we know that you know it would be uh, not unusual for a certain percentage of those <laughs> of those containers to fail in a major um, storm surge event driven by a cyclone. And we might be looking at something in a sort of just uh, normal scenario of failure, something like 10 times the volume of the Exxon Valdez spill, but happening within uh, the confines of what will soon be the third largest city in the country. So it's hard to get your head around what that event might be, but it's a real event and it could come sort of as we know at any time. So compared to all that, you know, catastrophic flooding sounds like something we can almost grapple with, right? And uh, so what's to be done and what has been done? Uh, those of you who follow these matters in Houston know uh, for a city that has been praised as having the second most engineers per capita after Silicon Valley uh, is unsurprisingly a lot of focus upon uh, what we call in the infrastructure studies business gray infrastructure. So infrastructure that is focused around high energy materials like concrete and steel with the expectation that we can use these human uh, infrastructural designs to control natural processes in a predictable, reliable kind of way. And that's everything in Houston from personal infrastructure projects like the two to $300,000 cost of raising homes in the Meyerland area and elsewhere along Braze Bayou up to 10 feet, um, in part through federal grants and part through our tax dollars are paying for this. Um, but also we're looking at much larger, more ambitious plans of regional gray infrastructure networks um, composed of widened channelized water courses, uh, streamlined bridges, large scale uh, detention systems and so on. And I'll come back to Project Braze a little bit later, but Project Braze is a good example of one of the most ambitious of these projects that happened before Hurricane, was just sort of wrapping up as Hurricane Harvey arrived. 
looking ahead, um, in infrastructural utopias abound. Uh, a lot of coastal engineering proposals in, in part to address that issue of precarity along the ship channel that I just mentioned. Um, some of them coming from this very campus. Some of the most reasonable proposals I'd go as far as to say coming from this, uh, this campus, the Galveston Bay Park Plan. Uh, you might have seen, those of you on the Speed Center listserv might have seen that come out yesterday. Uh, what's happening in the background is a lot of very interesting speculative uh, engineering work by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, including uh, rather ambitious plans for moving water between watersheds in times of emergency, and who can forget the um, deep tunnels, which are a matter of a great, uh, great interest in town. Um, but I have it on pretty good authority that these deep tunnels probably will never be built. They would cost $100 million a mile to make. So even to defend one of our many uh, bayous here would be run into the billions of dollars. And um, also, essentially, because of the lack of elevation here, when you're digging these deep tunnels, uh, you're really just creating very small underground lakes. And once they fill up, they're not really gonna give a whole lot of relief. Um, so they're studying them. Um, Harris County Flood Control is studying these, but uh, I've heard sort of off the cuff, off uh, sort of not, not a formal um, estimates that this could be as little as like a 1% reduction in peak water flow. And yet in Houston, we're willing to throw potentially hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars at solutions of that kind. It's an example of what my anthropological colleague Adriana Petruna calls diligent insanity. And there's a lot of diligent insanity in terms of stormwater uh, management in Houston. So moving now to um, what's happening in the Northeast, there we have more specific problems, um, problems that again have to do with histories of environmental and infrastructural racism in town. Uh, we have uh, some of the largest expanses of open pit ditch drainage uh, anywhere in the city. And um, also um, in part because of the um, careless uh, placement of major infrastructure like highways and rail lines, also a number of different impediments that cause water to back up. So in the Kashmir Gardens neighborhood, I'm sure folks have heard about the catastrophic flooding there. And I've heard estimates anywhere from 40% of homes flooded to 80%. So I'm just putting 60% down as a sort of mid-range estimate. Um, but for a community that is you know, 29% below the poverty line, and you still have folks years later who are displaced by these events. And in the right image here, you can see what happens when that open pit drainage isn't maintained. And I don't blame the residents there, but about 20 years ago, the city decided to transfer responsibility for maintenance of that infrastructure from themselves to residents. And again, people already facing a lot of economic stress and other kinds of stressors who then have to take on these projects uh, themselves. So. Um, Albert and I took a trip up to the Northeast a couple of weeks ago, and we got to see some examples of this, this open pit drainage in action, what some of the residents call drainage to nowhere. And this isn't the greatest image. It would be better if I could do it like a drone image of it. But imagine behind the point where the picture is being taken, there is a sort of a line of drain, a drain what seems to be a drain line that kind of comes to the end and just creates a loop. Uh, and so it doesn't really drain in, a, in any formal sense. There's a hole, as you see, underneath the railroad berm there, but that too leads, uh, Albert investigated it, he was braver than I was, clambered over the railway tracks and saw that there was really not much to be seen on the other side. So. Um, in fact, these open pits you know, really don't function as so much as a drainage system at all, and thus don't really offer people uh, the relief that you might find in other parts of Houston. Um, I have to acknowledge that there have been recently some more conventional gray infrastructure projects in the Northeast, one in particular, um, Project Hunting, which was finished recently based on that $2 billion bond that came out after Harvey, um, finished in 2023, proposed first in 1948. So um, when, when you begin to understand the frustration and suspicion that many residents of the Northeast have about waiting for Harris County Flood Control or other agencies to take care of the problem for them, it's in part because you know, they're the only major infrastructural investment they've seen uh, in the past 75 years has taken you know, that long to create. Um, and so uh, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about an alternative infrastructural utopia that's taking shape uh, and it's in dialogue with civil engineers and, and anthropologists Apologists, uh, but especially driven by interests in the community leadership of the super neighborhoods 48 and 52, that is Trinity Houston Gardens and Kashmir Gardens, an interest in finding ways to bring 
stormwater uh, infrastructure back uh, under community control to a greater extent to assert more capacity for to engage and control this process of managing uh, flood water. And I want to tell you about rain gardens, which if you haven't heard about them are really simple and but yet a sort of fascinatingly uh, powerful idea of hyperlocal uh, water management. Basically, a rain garden is a dugout. You find a place where water is pooling already. You dig that out a bit more. You put in logs, you put in leaves and mulch, cover it over with dirt, plant it with local uh, flora that uh, hopefully have those long root systems that a lot of the coastal prairie do, sponging up a lot of water. And uh, you can create both a sort of detention system, but also you can create something that can be quite beautiful at the same time. So it fulfills multiple purposes of both creating something that can keep water out of homes, uh, but can also create something that is an amenity to the community in multiple kinds of ways. These are some images that I wanna show you from the creation of the first rain garden in the Northeast, the community rain garden that we dug together up at uh, Trinity Gardens Baptist Church in um, 2002. And it only took a few hours really to, to construct this rain garden with the help of uh, about a dozen folks from the community. And you can see it here being dug. Shout out also to KG Asakura on the left hand side from Asakura Robinson, who does a lot of terrific pro bono work around green infrastructure in town and who uh, definitely pitched in to help uh, with this as a, a designer and a sort of cheerleader to get everyone excited about the possibilities of rain gardens. Um, I mentioned infrastructural citizenship as an alternative potentially to that more top-down technocratic gray infrastructure model. Um, I think this best should best be understood as an experimental practice, but it's one that builds upon the community's own interest in building civil power to combat a number of different issues that their, uh, that their area faces, everything from the air pollution from concrete batch plants, uh, the uh, legacy uh, uh, toxins from creosote production that have create, created cancer clusters in the area, um, as well as uh, a lot of neglect by um, basic services like waste removal, a lot of legal dumping happens in this area too. So there, it's not just one thing that's being faced, obviously, but um, this, the stormwater issue has become a very prominent issue since Harvey uh, because of its really existential impact, especially on Kashmir Gardens. And these efforts have been embraced as a way of sort of building uh, through engagement with the creation, the maintenance, and the management of infrastructure, a way of building civil power and multiplying it in, in what's, again, focusing on a broader, ultimately, set of issues, but derived in a way from the engagement with, with uh, work on stormwater. And I'll just read a quote here, which I think captures that this is, yes, it's about controlling floods, absolutely, but there's a more expansive community vision for what this infrastructure can do. And I think this quote from uh, a gentleman named John, who met in his 70s, who spent a lot of time uh, throughout his life fighting on the front lines of a number of social justice issues, why he sort of sees the, the embrace of this green, green infrastructure to be so, uh, have so much potential. So he says, the fun part of it, the part I love, is that you have a lot of older people in this area who have large blocks of property, sometimes just a bare house on a lot. And if someone were to just give them a little insight, a little knowledge, a little know-how, they could use their land in different ways. They could uh, bring in some rain barrels for that little garden in the back, get some native plants in there that soak up water, plant some trees which are good for the shade and also help with the pollution from the concrete batch plants. And you know it beautifies the place too, folks go, it's going to be pretty, right? So um, yes, uh, definitely about, about dealing with an urgent problem and using the sort of technologies that are, are not $100 million solutions, but are actually solutions that can be created with, with time and, and some sweat equity uh, tools from the local tool library. You can build a rain garden with very little, as it turns out. And even some of the other uh, green infrastructure solutions that the community is looking in, like permeable pavement, uh, like natural detention systems, are ones that uh, can be accomplished for a fraction of the cost of what some of the major sort of mega projects would be costing and also done importantly in much less time. So here's just a couple more pictures. You can see the, the dugouts being created here in the left image. You can see the logs going in on the right. You can see the leaves and, and um, branches and some of the mulch going in here. You see Ken Williams, the vice president, of, of Trinity Houston Garden smiling on the right as we're bringing this rather arduous, uh, it, there, there's, a, there's an issue of digging in Houston and the summer is not easy. <laughs> I don't wanna underestimate the fact that there is, when I say sweat equity, I mean quite literally sweat equity. 
Um, and in terms of next steps, and, and Albert will be talking a bit more about this too, but we're talking right now about a couple of projects. One, to create a, a, another community rain garden uh, that would be uh, in, in conjunction with Kashmir High School. And um, it would be a place where their uh, science club could learn about botany and hydrology and the skills involved in creating and maintaining green infrastructure. Um, so be sort of a living science lab, but also one where you would help sort of spread some of these ideas and skills throughout the community. Uh, and again, in places, you know, there's a lot of situations in this neighborhood where digging rain gardens could actually uh, contribute to keeping water out of people's homes, uh, probably at least as effectively as some of the conventional um, infrastructure projects that are under um, uh, discussion. And then across the street, uh, a larger project, uh, Trinity Gardens Park has been slated by Houston Parks uh, for renovation. Um, and this is a chance here. The community is pushing very hard to have green infrastructure elements incorporated into this, detention, permeable pavement, demonstration projects, uh, solarized um, basketball court, a number of other things are under discussion. And one of the things that Albert and I are working on right now is to support an EPA proposal that would help to provide the funding to create demonstration um, infrastructure of this kind, uh, the Healthy and Resilient Communities Program. I'll leave you uh, with a bit of a thought experiment. And it's a thought experiment that was inspired by a man named Art Story, who the old timers among you may remember, uh, he hasn't been in office for a while, but at one point he was uh, some, somewhat of a czar of public infrastructure for Harris County. And he had an idea, I think, which is an idea ahead of its time, that, uh, that if you were, if every building in Houston were to have a two by four rain catchment next to it, you could put Harris County flood control out of business. Uh, those are his words, not mine. And so I thought that's an interesting idea um, and probably you know, one that we need to add some numbers to it. I'm not a mathematician, uh, but I did, I did try to run some basic numbers on this, looking especially at what Project Raise, which I mentioned earlier, cost and what its detention capacity is predicted to be. So uh, $480 million, uh, 30 years to complete, 21 miles of channel conveyance improvements, four stormwater detention basins, all told uh, the ability to detain 3.5 billion gallons of stormwater. But it's no surprise and secret to those of you who live along the Braze Bayou, as we do now, that regardless of Project Braze, which was mostly complete by the time Harvey arrived, Braze Bayou still flooded catastrophically. So we have to assume that that project, although it probably did keep some homes out of harm's way, was not nearly sufficient to the task at hand. Um, and it, often because of the timelines of these projects, they're often planning for the storm conditions of 30 years ago rather than the ones that we face today. We know how fast our 500-year floodplain became a 100-year floodplain in Houston. On the other side of the equation, 782 housing structures in Houston. If each of these homes had a small rain garden, 10 cubic meters, about the size of what we dug up in uh, Trinity Gardens, that would alone be a distributed capacity of 2 billion gallons. And then if we ask businesses maybe to dig a little deeper, uh, create larger rain gardens, we might be able to bring that up to something close to what Project Braze did, but yet distributed throughout the city and attentive to issues of local hydrology and local impedances that might actually in some ways make it less of a blunt instrument for cutting down on flooding because we would be looking carefully at the knowledge of, of local residents to understand flooding patterns. So that's just something else to think about. And I would submit that with proper incentives for civic engagement, this would not take 30 years or $480 million to do. Um, so uh, here's my what if. Instead of waiting uh, for uh, deep tunnels or some other great infrastructural utopia to save us, what if Houston were to organize a citywide rain garden campaign instead to create a, a more robust, perhaps, and just network, a distributed network of stormwater management. Um, we wouldn't have to wait uh, 30 years to see the value of that, I think. And plus there would be maybe some hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million beautiful little flowered gardens added to the landscape of the city. And then of course, what I like to think about, and I think what folks up in the gardens like to think about too, is if you could organize people to do that, what else could we organize people to do? And I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you, uh, and thanks, Dominic. Um, hard to follow. Um, uh, as Dominic mentioned, I am going to push a little bit into the future. And thinking through the, the problems that we're facing here, um, 
uh, in terms of, of what has, I guess, uh, in terms of recent history um, and the, the prospects of urbanism in, as Dominic said, our, our city built on a swamp. Um, a couple of things to just get started. I'm a bit of a Cassandra. Uh, when I read the IPCC reports, I get totally freaked out. They are stunning in what they predict. Um, carbon emissions have gone up since COVID, way past already, past the, the COVID low, the COVID plateau as it's called. We're heading, we're, we're heading in the wrong direction. Um, I think that, that the, the idea that we could get a green energy transition in time is something that needs to be questioned. Primarily because to, to stay under 1.5 degrees of warming, we have to cut our carbon emissions in half by 2030. That's six years. And the last, one of the reasons that the last IPC, IPCC report, which is the United Nations uh, uh, scientific body that reports every uh, four or five years on climate change, there's six assessment in 2021, we've passed the, the one and a half degree surface warming uh, mark. And uh, in the spirit of, of a thought experiment, uh, this is my thought experiment that is very late in the game and that, that we need to think through how our cities might change and adapt to what's coming in the next couple of decades. Uh, actually, what I'd like to do is try to imagine what a city would look like if it were able to, to sustain uh, or limit surface warming to 1.5 or 2, 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, we've been working on this project since Harvey, since 2017. That freaked us all out. And I've, I've um, often find, found it difficult to explain it um, uh, in terms of thinking of the big urban picture. Uh, but I found a, a writer who's much more talented than I am uh, in the New York Times last year. And uh, I just wanted to read through this. Um, very quickly, this is the paradox at the heart of climate change. We burn far too many fossil fuels to go on living as we have, but we have also never learned to live well without them. The problem of the future is how to create a 19th century carbon footprint without backsliding into 19th century standard of living. No model exists for creating such a world, which is partly why paralysis has set in at so many levels. The greatest crisis in human history may require imagining ways of living, not just energy production, but, but of daily habit that we have never seen before. How do we begin to imagine such a household? Uh, architects, urban designers, their job is to imagine households and to imagine what kind of household we might need uh, in the coming decades. So the, the work that we're doing is, is based on this set of, of uh, prerequisites. Uh, uh, I like to think of what Dominic just presented as the first step, as what we need to be doing now and immediately. Um, uh, the question that I like to, what I'd like to follow through on is essentially what comes next? Um, a couple of things. Um, let me make sure I don't go over time. Um, to point out about our swampy city is its bayous, its watersheds, um, and the way we've handled those bayous and watersheds uh, for the last 50 years, 70 years. Uh, this is Bray's Bayou on the upper left, your upper left. Uh, it's already falling apart. You can see on the upper right is in Memorial Park. That's what the bayou looks like prior to any any um, scraping or, or armoring. Um, John Anderson once told me that the bayous really took shape uh, 20,000 years ago, uh, as opposed to the kinds of things we've, we've done to attempt to alter them 
which have, are about 50 or 60 years old. That's a time frame that I like and appreciate, that the bayou is going to be here and find, find some kind of ground in, uh, that the bayou is, is going to be here. Uh, regardless of, of our little mucking around with it um, and the, the, the successes and failures we've done, we want to keep in mind what's underlying the city uh, and the importance of it. Uh, so on the bottom left, I don't know if you guys know, they don't, uh, the Parks Board doesn't uh, toot their horn very much, but Bayou Greenways 2020 is a remarkable aspect of our city. But in 2020, uh, the pieces were in place, a public-private partnership, 150 miles of the bayou, which is 90% of it, I think, uh, is, is now in the public domain, which is extraordinary. 150 mile linear park system uh, in Houston. Uh, the closest to that is Portland, who has, I think, 65 miles of linear park around their, their uh, cities. It's important to recognize, number one, uh, that, that this exists. The second thing that's important to recognize is why it happened. It happened because Houston is so dispersed and they could actually afford to buy the land to put this together before it got too expensive. There is an idea that Houston could develop around these green parks into the future, a very different kind of city than the one that we've developed around, for example, the freeways. Uh, it is, I think, a resource that is just waiting to be tapped. Uh, back to the flood. These are actually the drawings on the left-hand side of the uh, uh, sections through Kashmir Gardens, which Dominic was talking about. The, the whole, <laughs> the hundred-year floodplain, everything is below the hundred-year floodplain, the entire neighborhood. Uh, this is the kind of problem that we're facing. Um, the, the numbers here, uh, the 100-year floodplain, there are 101,000 structures in it. The 500-year floodplain, there are 86,000 additional uh, structures in it. Um, uh, and that was before the Atlas 14 uh, renewed and revised the floodplain data which has essentially, as Dominic mentioned, turned the 100-year floodplain into the 500-year floodplain. Um, uh, sorry, the 500-year floodplain into the 100-year floodplain. Uh, we have an enormous problem, 180,000 structures in the 100-year floodplain. That's crazy. And one of the crazy things about it is that we can't even get our head around it. And one of the reasons we can't get our head around it is because it's such a, a gnarly problem, right? We, if you can't think of a solution, it's hard to take on the problem. One of the things that we want to do is to, to uh, uh, provide a solution, suggest one of what could be many solutions that would allow that problem in, to allow the problem, to put that problem on the table. Um, uh, and begin to address it like intelligent people. Uh, the, the drawing on the, the photograph on the right is always oh, been interesting. Um, if you see the little diagram up there, the, the bayou system is linear, goes from, east, uh, from west to east, and the, the structure of, of, of Houston is concentric, very different. Right? It's in circles, the loop, the parkway, um, uh, radiating lines out from the center. It's not an, an accident that the, the kinds of pictures that we see generated from the flood from Harvey, I would say 75% of them are of a freeway diving into a bayou, which is what this image is. It's a systematic thing, right? It's geometry. When you overlay a, 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 a concentric system around a linear system, you have a systematic problem, a, a predictable collision. And part of that is to set up the kind of strategic thinking that's required to imagine what's going to happen in 10 years, what's going to happen in 20, 30, 40 years. So uh, this is uh, the um, uh, energy corridor, which is the, also happens to be, uh, in a, a profound sense, um, the widest freeway in the world, 35 lanes wide. Uh, and still crowded. Um, if you know the term induced demand, you know what, what that's about. Um, 
this is, this is the reality that we're living in now. This is the, the problem that we have to deal with. 75% of the population lives outside the loop of Houston. And they live in a low, very low density, five, six units per acre suburban tracks, right? The, the image on the bottom is a carbon map of what's called megalopolis. Uh, megalopolis was a term that was invented in the 50s. Uh, which noticed and first understood that urbanism, cities were growing together. This was called by its author, Boss Wash, Boston to Washington. It's a mashup before the term was invented. And so this is a carbon map by zip code of Boss Wash. Um, it sort of cuts off the top, but you get the idea. Um, and what you're looking at is a series of, with the leader lines in the cities, the older cities that are the cores of megalopolis. Uh, what, is, what you see in red is high emissions. What you see in gray, green is relatively lower emissions. Surprise, surprise. Traditional cities have a much lower carbon footprint than the cities we've been building for the last 75 years the cities like we've been building here in the energy corridor. Um, this is the scope of our problem, right? If we want to take it on, it is, it is though, this is a 600 mile long city, continuous city. Uh, we have one here, it's the Gulf Coast uh, uh, mega region and the Texas Triangle mega region. Uh, this is how cities are developing. This is the scale of our problem, all this red stuff. So uh, since I'm a designer in an architecture school and I teach design, uh, I have to connect this problem up to what I do. One of the, one of the key connections for us has always been uh, density um, uh, and the relationship of density to per capita car uh, carbon emissions. So the diagram on the bottom uh, you've probably seen it's, it was begun and updated for the last 50 years. Uh, it's uh, energy uh, versus in the vertical column versus urban dispersion in the horizontal column. Houston's on the upper right, Hong Kong's on the bottom left. There is a direct correlation between density and urban dispersion. The amount of density that it takes, the, the, sorry, the amount of energy that it takes to actually support a six unit per acre suburb is uh, enormous and of a significant magnitude greater than a traditionally um, uh, dense urban environment. And the diagram at the top is showing per capita um, energy consumption uh, in the United States, the running on the top. The European countries are roughly in the middle. And on the bottom of that diagram is essentially the world average uh, China, uh, this was uh, just after 2000. Um, there was one thing that was weird about this diagram is they put Hong Kong in as a country. And Hong Kong is the only, Hong Kong and Seoul are the only modern cities that are anywhere near the kind of average that we're gonna need to keep warming below two degrees Celsius, surface warming. What's important about that is what I was, was talking about at the beginning is uh, the problem of the future is how to create a 19th century carbon footprint without backsliding into a 19th century standard of living. We need modern cities where our, our, our entire social uh, structure is, is based on a series of assumptions that have to do with mobility, they have to do with personal space, they have to do with connection to the landscape. Uh, we could not go back to live in a 19th century city anywhere near uh, with, with uh, the kind of ease and comfort that we might imagine. So that uh, to move forward really quickly, what we're trying to do is think through a model of density for a city and actually a country that hasn't built densely in the last 75 years. The last real dense areas we've built, we've added to them, uh, Midtown Manhattan, downtown Chicago in the loop. Uh, we don't have a current model of density, not one that will take us into the future.
So this is what, what we, how we focus our task. I think the drawing on the left is fairly um, uh, descriptive of an uh, existing suburb, uh, a tree grid, a tract house, uh, wildlife, street life, and pulling together into a much more dense model of, of urbanism and urban dwelling uh, that then opens up a large amount of urban space, of open space, sorry. Um, the drawing on the right, the drawings on the right, have to do with the, um, the kind of funny idea of putting the city into the carbon cycle. So the, the understanding cities and cycles is pretty important. Um, building cycle, uh, uh, commercial buildings amortize over 25, 30, 30 years. Uh, residential buildings, you're going to re be rebuilding every 60 or 70 years or doing a, a gut remodel. That comes out to about a 50-year building cycle, right? Um, imagine this, that we, this is a thought experiment. We go out to Main Street, get in a time machine, uh, come out 50 years later, everything will be, have been rebuilt in the last 50 years, meaning starting today, right? Is that clear? That, that cities turn over, and that is our opportunity to redesign them, to reimagine them. We don't have to rebuild in the same way that we're building now. At every building cycle, we have an opportunity to address the problems of the day and to respond to them urbanistically. Cities are thought of as permanent, they're not. They are completely always transforming. The other cycles we look at is the tree cycle um, for reasons that I'll talk about in a second. Um, uh, and the occupancy cycle, people in, in uh, the United States move on the average every five years. Very important to think of when you're thinking about in the future and especially when you're, when you're working with local communities. We're interested in where cities are now, but we're also interested in the future. Um, uh, the cycle of trees. Uh, we've worked on projects of essentially trying to imagine um, urban forestry, which is a generic term for landscape within a city, uh, as carbon capture. So it's, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, trees in Houston last longer than buildings. That's important and wonderful, I think, actually. Um, and so what we, this is a transformation of a neighborhood in the Fifth Ward uh, from several years back. These are the, the carbon uptake rates of various tree species in the United States, in, sorry, in the Houston area, uh, and their numbers down below. And the idea that we could start cutting for carbon capture. Uh, trees absorb a huge amount of carbon when they're young and growing, and that tapers off as they age. There's a kind of cycle in that, which is what the one in the middle here is about, uh, that I think we can capture and build on. Uh, we're proposing a series of, of buildings and a way of thinking about buildings um, that is uh, essentially trying to tap into uh, cross-laminated timber, uh, renewable resources of construction, low carbon, um, uh, uh, sources of construction material, but also 50% um, of the weight of wood is carbon. It's like a storage battery, right? It stores carbon, it's carbon storage. As designers, we haven't thought really much about wood as carbon storage. We thought about it in a, among in a lot of different ways. Uh, and so uh, all of our projects have been looking at trying to deal with carbon, with um, uh, cross-laminated uh, timbers uh, technologies. Uh, and we happen to have, through efforts of actually people in this room, um, uh, an example on, on campus, which is the Hanson College Extension that was finished the year before last. Uh, and if you haven't gone over there, go over there. Uh, and you have to go inside. It's, it's obviously clad in brick because this is rice. Um, but uh, the, the feel of the building is extraordinary. Um, and uh, it's a, it's a, a viable um, uh, construction technique which is being pushed and pushed technically and has an a enormous future to it. It's the carbon footprint of concrete is extraordinary. It's huge, right? Compared to a material that, that not only 
is less carbon intensive to produce, but actually stores carbon. Anyway, what we do with those cycles and with the cross laminated timber construction is to think through uh, returning now to Houston and there's 150,000 uh, structures in the 160,000 structures in the 100 year floodplain is we uh, try to combine uh, flood protection, uh, pulling people's out of harm's way and creating a flood basin uh, with public open space. Combining those two things together is a possibility, meaning we, we can't do a redevelopment project and a flood project. We'll be lucky if we get one, but if we put the two together, we're ahead of the game, which is why it's calling it a win-win. We can build upstream a retention basin, which is also an amazing public space, and we have an example of one called Willow Waterhole in Houston, um, uh, and at the same time, keep water out of people's living rooms downstream, right? There's just a kind of obvious synergy between um, flood protection and urban renewal that we want to tap into. Um, this is uh, very simple. I probably shouldn't be talking about this to a more general, about this to a more general audience, but just very quickly, uh, one of the ways we think about cities as well as buildings is it is kind of characterized between a uh, wiring diagram and the server racks, an IT closet. Uh, they're the same thing, right? This is the diagram that sits on the door of the, of the, the IT closet, and it shows a very orderly, neat organization of, of uh, uh, circuits, uh, servers, and connections between them, and the reality is what's at the bottom, right? As architects and as designers, we have to think a little, we can't go into that service, service closet without that diagram. Um, we have the same analogy in, in uh, we have another analogy that's just as interesting. Uh, if I gave my students the design of a spoon as a problem and told them to go out and study every spoon that's ever been designed, uh, it would be endless. What I can do instead is say, spoon, the design of a spoon is simple. It's a bowl and a handle. Every spoon you've ever seen is a bowl and a handle. We're trying to think about urban issues this way, is what is underneath it? What is structuring it? We have a lot of wonderful diversity that comes from these tangled wires, but in the end, we need to know what's underneath it. One of the things we discover is typology which again is a, a little bit showing you the, or talking a little bit about our back, the backstory of, of, of what we do. What I think is interesting to most people is that if buildings don't talk to each other, you can't make a city. Uh, buildings, cities are very simply explained as the whole that's greater than the sum of the parts, those parts being buildings. If those buildings don't add up, if they're random, you're not gonna get a city. And without a city, I would have a longer discussion to explain why it is without a city, there's no hope of solving our problems. We don't have an active typology, we have a passive one, and we can connect to that. Um, this is a prototype we did for an area, um, a, a little project, a big project that we did in uh, Meyerland, uh, which has a lot of upstream flooding above the Willow Waterhole which is an attempt to put together a kind of typological uh, solution, in this case, combining a slab and a tower and of, in, of, of starting to achieve economies of scale. Economies of scale are is very straightforward. The more units you produce, the cheaper each unit becomes. We need to start exploiting economies of scale in order to improve to, to provide decent housing. We are oftentimes uh, afraid of large scale th uh, objects that, oh, like that, it's, oh, it's too big. It's, I want my small house, I want um, uh, X, Y, and Z. I don't want to live in a dense urban environment. The, gr the grayest city is the greenest city. The most dense city is the most environmentally responsible and sensitive city that you can build. 
and to start to thinking about building in, living in density is something we need to do for reasons I was talking about before. Let me say at the, the, at the beginning of this, it is a problem that is generational. Uh, all of our projects span over decades and we're thinking about transforming living patterns, not tomorrow, even though we need to do, we need to start changing as quickly as possible. Um, the point being that we can start to think through, and uh, this is a, a, a rather large housing block uh, made out of wood construction, uh, uh, cross laminated timber construction. Um, that is open and aerated, uh, kind of like when you see lumber stack, it's got little sticks of wood uh, to separate it, to keep the wood dry. We're trying to preserve the, the wood and think through a wood construction that would that make sense uh, and that would preserve the wood as long as possible. Um, I won't go into the building uh, because of time, but I will say that there's an urbanism attached to this where the single building becomes a double building uh, and we have a bracket of space and that bracket of space looks something like that and a way of producing a public realm around these green armatures, the ones I just talked about with the Bayou Greenways project. Um, and that those, those pairs of buildings can start to add up to a, a larger and larger urban environment. Uh, organized around a space, that the space is more important, the buildings really exist as almost like bookends to create these, these spaces. What we really need um, and what we haven't built in the last 70 years is public space. We have sprawled and sprawled and sprawled and the only, only public space we have ended up with amounts to a feeder road with a bunch of franchise restaurants on it for 75% of the city. How do we start making a city that's a city that lives up to the expectations that we have of a city uh, and the spatial, the spatial requirements of a city? How do we build a city that, that uh, responds to the natural environment? And in the end, with these uh, denser urban environments, how do we, um, uh, what, what can we start to imagine a city that has the energy savings that would keep us below two degrees of surface warming. Uh, the diagram on the right, which I'll finish with, is how this is done. Phase two, phase four, phase five, phase six. This is not uh, tabula rasa planning. It's not coming in with the bulldozer and scraping things away. It is about staging uh, new construction, as in the thought experiment that I gave you, about the 50-year um, uh, building cycle that we can come in and get project, get, take out houses that are deeper in the floodplain, that are older, and begin this reconstruction uh, across time. Uh, so those are the phases of the project. And this is a kind of diagram of leapfrogging, which I think is sort of self-explanatory, where we take the front row, we leverage the increased value of the front row on the new uh, reconstructed floodplain uh, in order to make the project happen. Um, I could talk about it at some depth, but it's not necessary. Uh, these are the images that follow. And that's it. Thank you very much.